So there's two different accounts, right? And they're both bots. They're not run by humans. Someone set them up and they just ran automatically for a while. Yeah, they ran. The first one was the Marcus bot, and it was um, it was created like at the beginning of 2013, I think. And it would like sporadically purchase large amounts of Bitcoin. And then it became inactive for a little while, and then the Willy bot popped up, and it started making regular, like, daily purchases of 10 to 20 Bitcoins per day. And, uh, Interesting. Yeah, and it was, it was pretty weird. So um, so you, went, you read the whole report, right, of the guy who studied the statistics and all the data re relating to Willy. Um, do you agree with the author's conclusions about it being um, it originating in Mount, Bo in Mount Gox? Um, I think it needs more investigation, and the writer of the report admitted that, but he did have some pretty, some pretty solid evidence, um, more, more so than just the two things I mentioned, which was that the two bots were trading during downtime, which, which uh, implies that it, or suggests that it was... Uh, they were ran on Mt. Gox servers, and then they started selling bitcoins at a convenient time for Carpalus. Uh, he he made he made some more uh, allegations other than those two, and gave evidence for it. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the report to to talk about them in detail. But uh, yeah. I mean, the report's online; anybody can look at it if they want to read it. Yeah, it's really interesting because. Uh, this this was all done basically through blockchain analysis, right? Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, it was the, the the author of the report said that it was um, based on database information released by Mt. Gox, but I mean, it probably I mean it came from the, the blockchain because it was just like right. transaction records. Yeah. And he, he probably matches up the, the data to see if things correlate between what Mount, Mount Gox records showed and what the blockchain actually showed. So what, what's, what I'm curious to, to see what happens during this whole case is whether they look at um, this data in the court uh, proceedings relating to Mount Gox. Because, you know, we, we didn't have a, a blockchain analysis or things like this in the past when when fraudulent activity happened at financial institutions. So, it, yeah, it should be interesting to see what yeah, happens I don't, with that. I don't see why they wouldn't use it uh, in the court proceedings because, um, I mean, I don't know anything about Japanese law, but, you know, in the U.S., that's obviously, you know, an act of fraud and it's punishable. So, um, I mean, I don't see why I wouldn't make it into the, the court hearings. And yeah. Mark Karpolis is going to get in a lot more trouble if they find out that he was actually running that thing. Yeah. Honestly, like, I it, my personal opinion is that uh, everything that I've seen so far shows that Mark Carpolis is, at, at the very least, incredibly incompetent, and I suspect that he actually might be a malicious actor, and I wouldn't put it past uh, him or Mount Gox to have set up these bots to um, to siphon out funds behind the scenes. Yeah, that that wouldn't surprise me. I mean, he's. None of it's been confirmed, but just my personal opinion is that he's a huge liar. I mean, he's a really bad liar, I think, but mm -hmm. and he just he just doesn't seem to care that that there so many people lost their money. I mean, what was it like six percent of uh, the world's Bitcoin supply was lost in the Mt. Gox crash, and nobody yeah, knows where crazy. it is. And and Carpool is just like, oh no, we lost it. We don't know where it's at. Yeah, transaction malleability. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> But in the meantime, he's spending fifty thousand dollars in Bitcoin for a coffee shop in his office building. Yeah, you know, I I was doing some extra research on that whole situation a couple days ago as well, like into Mount Gox's history, deeper into their past and stuff. And and you know, Ma Mark Carpolis originally bought Mount Gox uh, from the person who actually created it, uh, Jed McCallum, um, who also created Ripple way back in the day? Who also so he also sold Ripple to a different investor. So, like Mark, Mark isn't some guy who who uh, you know came upon Bitcoin and he and he, he was passionate about Bitcoin and wanted to develop some you know great exchange and do something positive for that community. He bought it from Jed McCaleb, hoping to make a profit off it, and you know. Jed didn't even uh, uh, vet the guy and look into him and research him. 
before selling Mount Gox to Carpolis. They didn't even meet in person before he sold it to him. So, you know, I'm I'm not really surprised at this. But the so many things have gone wrong, and they're still finding out, uh, you know, problems with bots siphoning up siphoning up off funds in the background. So, you know, I, I just I hope these uh, exchange operators uh, don't sell their uh, businesses to malicious actors anymore. You know. Yeah, I, I actually didn't know that about Carpolis. So, I mean, that makes it even more believable that he would do those shady things because uh, he wasn't, might not have been interested in Bitcoin. He just wanted to make some easy money, and he saw, you know, this this unregulated industry. He could just, you know, cheat the system. Yeah, yeah. It's de- I mean, we can't prove that yet, but I think it's definitely plausible that this guy just wanted to, you know, turn this thing into a giant scam. Yeah. But, I mean, the... At least some good came out of it because the other uh, exchanges or some other exchanges have started auditing themselves. Like, wasn't it? Yeah. It was Bitstamp, right? That just released their uh, internal audit. Yeah, Bitstamp just uh, did a cryptographic audit overseen by Mike Hearn, and they passed. Uh, basically, they proved that they have enough funds to cover people's deposits uh, right now. So, Bitstamp doing doing things to ensure people's confidence. Kraken is getting pretty reliable as a decent exchange. So yeah, it the, it the free market is correcting itself in a way, and people see all the bad stuff that happened on Mount Gox, and uh, you know they don't want to repeat that situation. Both the exchange operators and the people who use the exchanges don't want to repeat that pretty bad situation. Yeah, I think I actually I think that's a pretty great thing about the free market. I mean, because. I don't know about you. We haven't had a chance to like uh, have a lot of conversations, but I'm a libertarian, and so I, I mean, of course, I believe in free markets and things like that. And uh, I think it's just a really great example of of markets solving problems on their own. They don't need government regulations to do it, and they're yeah. they're using efficient methods, efficient solutions. Uh, you know, historically, any government solution has always backfired. Yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll bet you that the government wouldn't have suggested a cryptographic audit of these exchanges. <laughs> you know, they probably don't even know how cryptography really works to ensure an audit. You know. Yeah, I mean, um, so far the only government solutions I've seen is that New York, uh, the New New York State government is like crafting a bit license, which is basically just like a licensure thing. Yeah. Um, and that's just going to you know eliminate exchange competition. And then uh, the federal government has, or the I, yeah, the IRS, they've classified Bitcoin as property, so they can tax it. Yeah. Uh, capital gains tax, and really all that is, they're just trying to discourage people from using Bitcoin. But I mean, so far, all the government solutions I've seen have nowhere near as good as these internal audits. Yeah, I I think that. Um, like when Mount Gox first crashed, uh, people who didn't really know that much about the situation kind of judged it based on that and like, okay, Mount Gox uh, screwed up big time, so we need the government to step in and, uh, you know, first of all, put these guys in jail, you know, get the money back to users, and then have a bunch of regulations put in place to prevent it from happening again. But in a way, people just need to wait for time to pass and for the community community to react in and of itself and apply its own measures of self-regulation. Yeah, they just need, like, we need to learn from our mistakes, you know? Like, if we have all these government safety nets, uh, like, if, if an exchange fails and we get all our money back, then we're not really going to care about who's running the exchanges. You know, we're, yeah. we're not yeah. going to care if we lose our money, and so we'll just throw, we'll just throw our Bitcoins and our fiat at, you know, another carpalist. Yeah. Yeah, and who's to say that uh, you know any regulations that are putting put in place? Uh, you mentioned the New York State uh, regulations, the Bit License. Who's to say that uh, those regulations won't be outdated in another six months or another year? Uh, yeah. That form of auditing will become inefficient, and then you'll have old laws in the books that restrict the industry uh, while not really achieving what they were meant to achieve in the first place. Yeah, they definitely will. I mean. Even now, I can see at least one possible problem with it because um, these bit licenses are like 
they're for they're for Bitcoin exchanges, but you know what about um, what about altcoin exchanges like Cripsy? Yeah, you know yeah. those. You know that's just going to funnel activity into those exchanges. If, if these bit licenses don't cover those, I'm not sure. I need, I should probably do more research on that. But if that's the case and they only cover Bitcoin exchanges, then you know that's not really going to solve anything because you still have a, de a deregulated altcoin exchange. So it's just going to drive up the price of other altcoins. Yeah, and it'll leave other uh, exchanges of, of altcoins unregulated. So what are they going to do to address them? Are they going to make a different, you know, license for every uh, altcoin that people are trading? Are they going to make one catch-all license for all cryptocurrencies? Uh, it's it's really complicated and and yeah, I mean, it's essentially yeah. impossible to do that because you know that's that's just the nature of uh, cryptocurrency. It's you know it's impossible to regulate. Yeah, it, and it, also, yeah. what go were you ahead. gonna say? No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, well, also, I don't. I personally don't think that the exchanges will uh, be this popular forever, because the whole point of cryptocurrency is to replace monetary systems, not to act as like, uh, you know, a means of investment. And so, so once it once it gains more in popularity, and we start having like actual jobs that pay in Bitcoin. Uh, it won't. It won't be as uh, important to buy Bitcoin on an exchange because that's why most of the uh, that's why most of the the buying is going on on the exchanges right now because people are trading in their fiat for it. And so, I think in the future, you know, whenever however far into the future it is, the main purpose of exchanges won't be to you know get your foot in the door of the Bitcoin community. It'll be to you know exchange. Exchange fiat for Bitcoin and exchange uh, Bitcoin for other altcoins, um, but it'll be a much lower volume because there won't be as many people like trying to get in as like first-time users because there'll be more people like who actually have paychecks in Bitcoin. And so yeah. even then, so then we'll have all these new uh, Bitcoin services that come out of uh, the market moving away from the use of exchanges, and the bit licenses again won't. You know they'll be outdated. They won't protect anything. Right, right. That's a pretty good point. Because um, you're right. Up until this point, the vast majority of, of Bitcoin, like the way to, ways to acquire it, has been through exchanges and services like Coinbase, which isn't exactly an exchange, but uh, you still go on there to uh, buy and sell Bitcoin. Um, you're right. As time passes, there's just gonna there's gonna be more like grassroots. Um, uh, sending of the currency between people and not through these institutionalized exchanges. You know, uh, there's going to be more people getting their incomes in Bitcoin, more people exchanging goods and services for Bitcoin, and governments to regulate that when it's just person to person transactions and not some, you know, big company or something like that. Right. And I mean, it's all, like it's already happening. You know, it's not it's not a big stretch to imagine a world that runs on Bitcoin. You know, the, just recently, a few weeks ago, I think it was in uh, Silicon Valley, they had a Bitcoin job fair, and like 400 or 500 people showed up. And so wow. you, we're already seeing job opportunities that pay exclusively in Bitcoin. So it, it maybe it it might not be a. a too far into the future where, where this happens. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I, you know, I don't know if it, at, at some point it'll be like the overall main system that everyone uses, but I can see in the near future it'll at least be uh, something that sticks around and, you know, runs parallel to other forms of payment that people can get. It's like an extra source of income that right. you, can, you can try and get. Right. I'm, I'm a little bit more bullish on it. I think that it's going to take over everything. And uh, maybe not necessarily uh, Bitcoin will be the one world currency, but it'll be, like, the world will run on cryptocurrency. Uh, like, maybe not, maybe in, like, 100 years or something, but... Yeah, yeah. You know, at some point, the, you know, the centralized monetary systems, they just, you know, they won't last. They're broke. It's outdated. Yeah. yeah. Give it some time. To the moon. Yeah. Yeah, to the moon. Yeah, I wrote a story uh, a few days ago about there's a new Facebook web app that a company called Quitcoin, Quitcoin developed, 
And uh, it's basically a, a tiny little easy to use um, web app that you go to on, on your mobile device or on your computer. You sign in with Facebook, grant Facebook permission to access your friends list, and then you can send uh, any small amount of Bitcoin to any of your Facebook friends uh, as easy as you would post to their wall or send them a message. And I used it a little bit before, my, before I wrote my article, and it's pretty uh, simple to use. I, I was surprised how well they did it. Um, have, you, have you checked this out at all? Uh, no, I read your article about it, but I didn't, I didn't know that the app was actually available for download. Yeah, I thought it was still in development. Yeah, it's not, you don't really download it from uh, like the App Store or something like that. It's just um, a web address that you go to in your browser. Okay. From Facebook, and then it's you just get taken to uh, a web page that's mobile optimized, so it looks good on your mobile phone or whatever. Um, so it's not really an app, and I don't know if they're gonna make a dedicated native app for it. They probably have that planned at some point, but right now it's just uh, just a web address that you go to, and you have to sign in uh, with your Facebook account and do it. Yeah, I think a dedicated app would be a good idea. I mean, it would work because then it would work just like a you know another online Bitcoin wallet. Yeah, yeah, actually that that would be a really good idea because then people could kind of um, just open the app directly from their smartphones and manage their funds right from there, send it to their friends, and you know I think that it might be the future of Bitcoin wallets, or at least there's a market for that type of Bitcoin wallet where. Uh, you would just sign in with a social service, be it Facebook or Twitter, um, I don't know, and, like, and, and you can just send money to your friends just by like, tapping on their name, and you don't have to deal with you know, long, complex Bitcoin addresses, public keys, private keys, and all of that. So you know, this is a step in the right direction that they, that they made to try and make this easy for uh, social media users to start working with Bitcoin easily. Uh, do they have? Do you know if they have like a marketing plan? Like how are, how are they planning on getting people to actually use this app? Or are they just gonna put it out there and see what happens? Yeah. Um, so far, they kind of just put it out there uh, to to see if people start using it. Uh, you know, they got a story on CoinDesk. It it kind of went viral on Reddit, and then I did my story about it um, and put it on Reddit. So. I don't. I don't even know if they have like a like a Facebook page dedicated to marketing this. I'm sure they do have their own Facebook page to collect likes and stuff. Besides that, there isn't there isn't much marketing. Uh, so it's kind of just going viral, and, and they're just gonna see where it goes from here. Yeah. Um, and you said uh, the other day that they're that they're probably planning on uh, expanding it to Twitter and Instagram, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that you know, that was partially speculation on, on my part. Um, I don't exactly know how that would work on Instagram. It would work on Twitter for sure. But yeah. they did say that they're they're looking into other other partnerships. They said with other companies and trying to expand to other social networks. So I assume that means at least Twitter, possibly something more exotic like Instagram. Yeah, because to me, Facebook doesn't seem like the best place to have a Bitcoin, uh, you know, tipping system. Just mostly because they're like they're losing users to Twitter and Instagram and whatever else is out there, and yeah. uh, the average user base of Facebook is starting to get a lot older. And so the people that use Facebook regularly aren't going to be the uh, you know the twenty somethings that are you know super excited about Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but you know, it, it it wouldn't hurt to try and bring Bitcoin to that older audience anyway. Uh, even if they can't understand it, even if they're not really interested in it, it's nice to to give them the ability and the option to use it if they want to. You know, experiment a little bit. Uh, but yeah, you're right that once once they expand this service to Twitter and and make this easy to do on Twitter as well, um, it'll probably get more attention. And I think that. Twitter, Twitter already has like a, a Bitcoin tipping bot. At least a couple of accounts that you can use to tip Bitcoins ac across Twitter. Um, but you know, do you uh, think that uh, this app will compete with those tipping bots? Because they, um, they're really popular on Reddit, especially the Dogecoin uh, 
tipping service. Yeah. It's like, would this yeah. be a way to like consolidate all those? You know, um, I don't. It, it really depends on how successful these bots are on on Twitter and how successful the Quitcoin thing is on Facebook. Because uh, it's different on Reddit. You know, on Reddit, uh, it's a conversational atmosphere. There's a, a collaboration between people. People can vote on which comments they think is best. Uh, put stuff to you know the top of the front page if they like it. Um, there, you don't get as much interaction like that. Uh, with tweets or even with Facebook posts. So there's a reason why tipping is so successful on Reddit. It's the way that system works. And, you know, it getting this stuff on Twitter and Facebook, it's it's more of an experiment at this, time, at this point. I don't really know of, of anyone personally that I know that, you know, tips people with Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency on Twitter or, or Facebook for that matter. It's just an experiment at this point. So whether it serves like a like a an actual need that people have, that's that remains to be seen. Yeah, like um I'm I'm the only person I know like in real life, not on the internet, that actually uses Bitcoin. So um if my you know, if my circle of friends is is the average, you know, across the country or around the world, it um you know, it might not work out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm pretty much the same way. Uh, like I, I, I have a couple of friends that I know in real life that use Bitcoin, but that's really only because I kind of got them interested in it and sold them Bitcoin at some point. So now they have some. Um, yeah, like I, I don't I don't have having a like a, a big economy where people tip each other and pay each other pretty often in cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I think that that ha definitely has to be the next development in the uh, crypto economy. Is that we got to get more uh, physical places like brick and mortar stores to accept Bitcoin. Uh huh. Because the internet, like the internet, is great and everything. Like Overstock accepts Bitcoin. That's amazing. I've bought uh, several things from Overstock with Bitcoin. Um, but in order for it to have like a real a real social influence, it has to have uh, it has to be applicable to the real world. Yeah, yeah. Well, th what's interesting is um, a lot of these brick and mortar stores that are starting to accept Bitcoin, and even even the online ones as well, uh, they pretty much use Coinbase and BitPay to convert to dollars, don't they? Yeah, they most of them have like a Coinbase or a BitPay wallet and. Uh, the customers, the customers, you know, scan the QR code and pay with Bitcoin, and they sell it immediately because you know all their expenses are in are in dollars or or in fiat currency. Yeah. So they don't really gain anything by holding it, except for you know, maybe they get, you know, a profit off of uh, appreciation, value appreciation. But um, like right now, they can't really buy anything for their business with it, and so that's that needs to change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at this point, anyone who goes to uh, any of these brand new retailers that are signed up with BitPay and pay with Bitcoins there, they're really kind of just working to drive the price down a little bit because every time they do that, it converts right to dollars. Um, I think it would be better to grow Bitcoin through grassroots acceptance and getting you know average people to accept it uh, on their smartphones or on or something like that. Yeah, no. well, that that's true, but um, at the same time, you know, every time you short sell something, and this is true in, in Bitcoin and stocks or uh, um, traditional currencies, anytime you short sell something, you're you're selling it to somebody that wants to hold it. So it so in the long in the long run, it's it's gonna equalize itself out. Like it might drive the price down at first, but uh, when when you sell it to somebody who holds it for a long time, it's gonna the price is gonna go back up. Okay, so you're you're saying that like even though if, if people spend uh, bitcoins, at, um, for instance, gift.com for gift cards, and they use BitPay to convert to dollars, you're saying that uh, BitPay is still going to have those bitcoins at some point, right? And and the yeah, like like whenever whenever you sell it, obviously there's somebody who's buying it, and they're buying it because they think it's a good investment. Uh, or, or because they want to use it, and so you know they might be short selling it, and it might in in the immediate term uh, 
make prices go down a little bit because uh, you know it depending on the volume of the sales. Uh, but but you know there's people that are buying it that are going to hold it for a while, and so uh, so it's gonna you know it's gonna make the value go back up. That's a good point. That's a good point. I didn't think about that. I guess even even if you're if it's being converted to dollars in the short term, that still means that someone's buying it right, and it's still stimulating uh, the economy. Yeah, and uh, I I think the more the more stores that accept it. Uh, even if they are short selling it for fiat, so they can pay their expenses, they're still raising awareness because you know they're going to have the little uh, sign up that says Bitcoin accepted here, so right. people might ask about it, and you know you'll get more consumers that start buying it, and uh, you know any any growth is is good growth, even even Silk Road. I I don't care if they're selling drugs with Bitcoin. If people are moving the currency, it's good. That would be a great discussion to have in a in another episode. Because I, I could probably talk for a while about that, too. Yeah, definitely. Black markets are, I think black markets are pretty awesome. But, yeah, that definitely should be another discussion. Definitely, yeah, yeah. So for this one, we've gone, okay, that's 30 minutes so far. Yep. That's pretty good. All right, so you want to wanna wrap it up, then? Yeah, yeah, let's close this up. All right, that was the first episode. <laughs>